Well, good morning, church. It is a great privilege and honor of mine to be here with you to open God's Word. Uh, before we do that, before we dive in, I've got a couple of things I want to walk through with you to make you uh, aware of, to let you know that's going on, because we have entered into a season here at LifePoint where we're, we're hustling and bustling. we got a lot of things going on, and uh, God is good. Amen? All right, we're tracking this morning. We're awake. We're, we're live. We're ready. Uh, one of the first things I want to make you aware of is our first step class. Uh, first step is an opportunity for you to kind of get to know us in a deeper way as a church. You might have been coming here for a few months, a few weeks, a few years, and you're not a member of LifePoint. Well, this is the first step in that process because we want you to know what we would require of you as a member of our church, what is required of, uh, I'm a minister, but required of our elder, elders as they oversee our church and pastors of our church. So if you want to mark your calendars for this, uh, the first step class is October 16th. Uh, I believe that will be during second hour, so if you want to be a part of that, please go online to this link and register for that. Uh, for our men in the room, where my guys at? Y'all with me? Yeah. Somebody over here, Peyton, he's away while we ride. Uh, my guys here, we got the Grit Outdoors coming up. Uh, this is one of the biggest uh, men's outreach events that we have. It's on October 18th. I believe we're, we're like roasting the pig, we're gonna have a big old bonfire, all kind of different like man things. So come ready, come be a part of that. Uh, we're gonna have a guy named Robbie Gallaty. He's a pastor of a church called Long Hollow. He's gonna come, uh, he's gonna bring a word for us to share the gospel through his testimony, uh, all of those different things. So if you are a man in this room and you wanna be a part of this, just come. Invite some friends. This is not a, uh, a, a strict dress code kind of thing. We're going to be outside. The weather's getting chilly. So bring your flannel, your jacket, all you got to do, and bring some guys that you know need Jesus. Maybe you're in this room and you need community as a man and you need Jesus. Please come to this. This is a great event for you to plug into. And the last thing I want to make you aware of is Fall Festival. Uh, this is an awesome event for our community. So Share with your neighbors that this is going on. It's gonna be October 23rd. Uh, it'll be out here in the field, in the parking lot. We're gonna be spread out all over this place. Uh, so we'll make sure that you mark that on your calendar and it'll be following our services that morning, uh, 4 to 7 p.m. on October 23rd. Uh, so go grab lunch, come back, hang out, and have a good time as we fellowship with one another as a community and as a body. And again, we don't wanna just hang out to hang out. So come be a part of this. Let's have gospel conversations with the people that are around us uh, and invest in our community. Uh, what, what I want to do before I dive into uh, God's word this morning is I actually want to pray for these things. So can we do that for a moment? Good with that? Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, God, you have already abundantly blessed us this morning in worship and through the prayer and leadership that we see, have seen take place this morning. Through the singing of your people, God, your presence is felt in this place. Father, I simply ask that your presence would be felt through First Step, through the Grit Outdoors, and through Fall Festival. Because God, we don't want to do things that you're not in. So Father, would you move in these? Would you bring people to these things so they can hear your gospel be proclaimed? Would you bring people to these things so that way they could find a church home, find community, plant roots? God, we lift these things to you. We lift the people that will attend these things to you because you are sovereign over all things. We just pray and ask that you would allow us to be obedient to your will in these things and with the people that you entrust to our church. God, we love you. We praise you. And may you be all the glory and all the power and all the dominion. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. If you don't know who I am, uh, there was a lower third up a minute ago. My name is CJ Biggs. I am the lead high school and young adult pastor here at LifePoint. Uh, I have a beautiful wife who I met in high school. We were high school sweethearts. I know that's an anomaly, uh, but we were true. We were one of the, the few out here. Uh, I have two beautiful daughters uh, that I am so overjoyed to have, and I would ask for prayer for that. Uh, there's nothing wrong. I'm just vastly outnumbered in my home. I'm the only guy there. My dog's not even a boy. Uh, so I'm struggling. So I need you to pray for me in that. Uh, where are my girl dads at? We got any girl dads in here? Yeah, the few and the proud. Come on, I like it. We could all covet and love your prayers. So if you would pray for us all, because we not only have, are outnumbered in my home, our homes, but we are also the brokest, because um, girls are expensive. Yeah. So speaking of, of expenses, my family and I just got back from Disney. Uh, and it was honestly 
one of the most amazing trips I've ever been on. I, I've been on. I told my wife, I said, I know why people go to Disney, come back, and they're like crazy about Disney things. Like I, I had a moment where I told my wife, I was like, hey, I, I think I might be a weird Disney person from this, on, this point on out. And she told me, she said, CJ, that just doesn't fit you, so don't try it. Just enjoy it and move on. You got it, boss. I got you. I'm doing it. Uh, but it was just a sweet thing. And one of my favorite moments was uh, we went to Epcot. And it was the last night, and it was not my favorite moment because we were flying home the next day. Uh, but that last night, we, we stayed out late, and we watched a fireworks show at Epcot. And I'll have to say, if you ever invite me to a fireworks show, I know I've been to a few of, of different people's in this room's fireworks show. I, I will now silently have to judge you based upon what I saw at Epcot. I appreciate the invite. I'm going to appreciate your fireworks. But the, what I saw at Epcot was phenomenal. Uh, the fireworks, the lights, the water, the, the whole scenario. But it was not the fireworks that made that uh, night special for me. It made it special for me because I had a moment with my family because it was my first time there, my daughter's first time there, uh, Florence and Sayla, she's three months old, so she doesn't know that was her first time there. Uh, but it was her first time there, and it was my first time that we and my wife and everybody went as a family together to Disney. And I'm experiencing something that I've never experienced before. In a shared experience with my family, all, everything is new, and it honestly brought tears to my eyes. As I'm, as I'm like the proud dad filming the fireworks, turn around and filming my kids and my wife because of just the looks on their face of just joy and awe and adoration about what they see before them. And over the weekend, as I was preparing for this sermon, I began to think about how much more does our heavenly Father feel that affection when we sit at his feet and stare at him in awe and wonder about what is before us in Christ himself. And this is why Paul in Colossians 2 is laying out really the most beautiful gospel exhortation that in all of the New Testament. He wants us all to forever be changed by the presence of God. But to be able to do that, we have to know first and foremost who he is. We have to know who God is and what he's done for us. And it was also of the utmost importance that Paul was extremely clear about the truth of Christ because there were people in the church who were seeking to add observances from the Jewish customs onto Christians. So these false teachers were so infatuated with the law of the Old Testament, they actually missed the forest despite the trees. I know many of you know that saying. But they missed the point behind these laws because they were so infatuated with the laws in and of themselves. And I think if we're honest this morning, we, we often do the same thing. We may not be infatuated with the laws of the Old Testament, but we constantly bring ourselves back to the yoke of slavery in our sin. And we're constantly feeling like we have to fight for the approval of God. This is exactly what's taking place here. And Paul combats this by reminding us that God's people have been set free. They have been redeemed in Jesus' blood and in his body. They have been purchased and bought. And we're gonna see this in our text this morning by looking past the shadows and looking to the substance. Those will be our two points this morning. Look past the shadows and look to the substance. Now, if you are willing and able, if you would open your Bible to Colossians chapter two, we're gonna read verses 16 uh, through 23. And I would ask again, if you are willing and able, if you would stand for the reading of God's word. Now again, standing for the reading of God's word does not make us levitate. It does not make us glow. It doesn't give us an extra halo or whatever crown jewel or whatever we have in heaven. Does that make sense? We do this out of honor for who God is and what he's done for us and what his word means to us. This is our life. This is our everything. Does that make sense? And after I finished reading God's word, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, uh, Shai Lin said, this is the word of the Lord. And he asked the congregation to respond, to respond and say, thanks be to God. That is an old church practice. Uh, that I would like to try this morning. So after I finish reading God's word, I will say, thanks be to God. And you will respond with, or I will say, this is the word of the Lord. And you will say, thanks be to God. All right. So Colossians chapter two, starting in verse 16 says this. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. Or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you 
insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, and do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, church. So the first point that we are going to walk through and unpack this morning is look past the shadows. If you'll jump back to verse 16 for a moment, it says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. What Paul is saying here and what he is trying to communicate here is don't let anyone exclude you because you don't participate in certain festivals, you don't partake in certain foods or you abstain from festivals, you abstain from different foods. He's saying don't let them disqualify you from God's family. I do want you to understand the things that Paul lists here in this text are not evil. They are not bad. They're actually commands in the Old Testament. But... What we have to be extremely careful of, church, is that when we remove Christ from the commands, we lose the power and the substance behind it. When we remove Christ from what he has asked us to do, it is a form of just legalism, laws, and slavery that we submit ourselves to. Because what ends up happening is that you begin to work for justification. You begin to try to earn the love of God. And hear me, you can't do either. So we have to fixate our eyes on Christ. For instance, circumcision was meant to foreshadow the death of Christ and the holiness of God's people. That's what it was meant to. The command of circumcision was meant to foreshadow the death of Christ and the holiness of God's people. But the legalists, the Pharisees, removed Christ from it and it became a source of superiority. It became a source of what's called ethnocentrism, which is an elevation of ethnicity or culture. So the Pharisees and the legalists lifted themselves and elevated themselves based upon the fact that they followed through with this command, had nothing to do with Christ. Take the Sabbath. It was meant to foreshadow the rest that Christ would bring to our lives, his children. But the legalists turned it into a source of condemnation, a source of Uh, of just restriction. And this is why Paul in verse 17 says, these are a shadow of the things to come. If you write in your Bible, highlight, underline, whatever, I would encourage you to do all of those things to this verse. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. It does not belong to you. It does not belong to LifePoint Church. (laughs) It belongs to Christ. And this should reveal to us that The shadows aren't a bad thing. They're actually arrows that point to Christ. They bring us to the feet of Jesus. But again, the false teachers were using them to elevate themselves. And hear me, that lane is a slippery slope. It is a downhill, just runaway train if you get on it. And the false teachers in Colossae skated down this hill as fast as they could by pressuring people to observe circumcision and the Sabbath in certain ways, but also they began to add different things. It's almost like they ran out of things they could add, so they looked at a vast wall of different religions and started piling a bunch of different things into the blender, like worshiping angels, intense visions, and bodily suffering. And they mixed it all up, and they said, this is the drink that you need for you to be right with God. The problem with that is, when you drink that Kool-Aid, when you take a drink of the, the the shake they've made you, you don't look more like Jesus. In all reality, we end up looking more pagan when we try to work out this justification by works mentality. And it's this tragedy that leads Paul to encourage, warn, admonish the people saying, listen, don't let them disqualify you. 
Don't let them exclude you from God's family because you aren't doing religion the way they want you to. You're in God's family because of Christ's work, not your own. I need you to hear me. You are in the family of God, not because you did something to earn it. You are in the family of God simply because of the work of Christ. And you will remain in the family of God because you are united with Christ. Scripture tells us that he loses none that are in his hand. There's nothing that can pluck you from the hands of God. Height, nor depth, authority, dominion, ruler. When you are saved by Christ, when you have surrendered your life to him, you are in his hands for all of eternity. Not because you earned it. Not because you brought something. Not because your prayer closet looks like the 16th chapel or anything like that. You remain and grow in your faith because you are connected to Jesus Christ. And our layering, as I was beginning to think about this, like we may not layer on Old Testament rule in our lives, but what we end up doing is we put certain stipulations on believers of today. Uh, And I have a list of these, and some of these might offend you. If they do, I'm I'm not not sorry, I want you to understand that. Uh, But people begin to say, man, if you drink alcohol, you're not a real Christian. You have to be baptized in a particular way to be a follower of Jesus. If you don't take the Lord's Supper X amount of times, I'm here to tell you, you don't love Jesus. Real Christians would talk about this or condemn that. Real Christians would vaccinate their kids or real Christians would not vaccinate their kids. I'm more valuable because I know this or I do that because I serve this way, because I, I, my attendance is 100% at church on a Sunday morning, and I, I serve more, so I'm superior than anyone that is around me. You're not Christian if you participate in Halloween. We know you're a believer if you can speak in tongues. Do you see what I'm getting at here? We add on these man-made things to what it means to follow Jesus. In our sinfulness, we think there has to be more for us to be accepted into the kingdom of God and church. That is simply not true. Christ is enough. This is why salvation by faith alone and Christ alone is so difficult for many of us to wrap our minds around. Because we have to think that there must be something more. That can't be it. It can't simply be that I'll place my faith in Jesus and I'm saved and I'm granted access to him. I'm restored in my relationship to God. I've got to clean myself up a little bit. I've got to quit doing this or start doing that. There's a guy I went to high school with. uh, He recently gave his life to the Lord, and that was his ordeal for many years. I've got to quit doing this and start doing that before God will accept me. Church, that's not how it works. He is the one who comes and picks up the broken pieces. He is the one who puts them back together and builds your life as it was designed to be built, not you. Broken people can't fix broken. It's already broken. There has to be an outside source come in and that outside source is Jesus in and of himself. To which Paul says in verse 23, this man-made thinking, this heaping on of thoughts or ideologies onto in faith alone and in Christ alone is a man-made religion and is of no use in stopping the indulgences of the flesh. Now, when we think about indulgences of the flesh, I think all of us automatically think about uh, porneia, which is uh, sexuality, sex, pornography, maybe even abuse of alcohol or drugs, all of these massive fleshly desires. But what we can't forget about and overlook is our fleshly desire to have self-righteousness. It's just as strong and just as powerful as if you were acting on those obvious fleshly desires. And here's what I mean. If you're in this room and you read your Bible every single morning and every single evening, if you get up and you embody the term or the phrase in the scripture, 
pray without ceasing. And your church attendance is meticulous. And you outserve and outlove every single person that is around you. And you have read every single theology book underneath the sun because you think all of those things add to your justification. You think doing all of those things will give God uh, some, you give, God will give you some extra favor in your relationship with him. You are just as much indulging the flesh as the next person who watches pornography every single day. Because the spiritual disciplines were not given to us to help us look good. Spiritual disciplines like Bible reading and prayer and church attendance and serving and worship, all of those different things were given to us to allow us to commune with God, to see him, to be known by him, to know him. That's what they were given to us for, not for performance, but for his presence. We want the presence of God. We want the presence of God. Paul calls these things sensuous because we're gratifying the desires of our flesh and church. Again, if we examine ourselves on this running list, I may have not said things that you're running after on this list. If you examine yourself and you're looking at this list and you say, I'm doing these things in hopes to earn the love of God, you are sadly allowing your good works to block out Christ. That's a sad and true reality. You're living under the shadow rather than basking in the glory of the sun. If we measure our worth by what we do, I need you to hear me, it is a complete and utter rejection of the work of Christ. A complete and utter rejection of the work of Christ. This is why Paul's glowing, neon, very large arrowed sign is to Christ in the entirety of this book. That's why the the arrow from all of scripture is Christ. Because this is not about do better. This is not some moralistic deism, meaning by my morals, I will be able to enter into heaven. This is about surrender. This is about God coming in the flesh to us to save a people who could not save themselves. This is about redemption through the blood of Christ, not you doing better. Because without the redemption of Christ in our lives, without him coming to earth in the form of a baby, born of a virgin, being crucified on the cross, dying, being laid in the tomb and raising, there is no hope because we can't be good enough. All of this is from him through him and to him. All of what we do here with our lives and within this church is about Christ because he is the substance. Look back at verse 20. Look at the substance. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why as if you were still alive in the world do you submit to regulation? The Colossians had uh, an inconsistency in the way they were living their lives and the things that they were speaking. We talk often about lost people who pretend to be saved. What we don't talk about is saved people who pretend to be lost. You're like, CJ, that, that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Well, matter of fact, it really does. Because if you think about it, if we are a believer if we are a follower of Jesus within this room and you constantly submit yourselves to the yoke of slavery, constantly submit yourself to this justification by works and earning mentality, that's exactly what you're doing. Believer, you are pretending to be lost. Galatians 5.1 says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For freedom, Christ has set you free, church. Believer, you have been set free through faith 
in Jesus Christ. And that freedom in Christ is a freedom to abandon sin. That does not mean we won't sin again, but we now have the freedom in a new nature to actually combat and fight against our sinful habits. We're not longer a slave, we're no longer a slave to sin, we're a slave to Christ. And you're also set free to run after God and strive for righteousness with no fear of condemnation when you fail. I remember, uh, I was actually at a staff retreat a few years ago. This, this verse, uh, there, there now is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, is one that I've had to tell myself over and over and over again. And it was at a staff retreat a few years ago when I sat down at a table and confessed uh, some lingering struggles and sin with pornography to a fellow staff member. And without like a flinch in his spirit or a twinkle in his eye, he looked at me and he said, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he sat there with me, he heard my heart, he spoke life into me. He didn't say, stop doing this and start doing that. He didn't give me a list of, of, of morality things to do better. Now I do have guardrails in my life, I do have accountability in my life. That is, we would be naive and, and honestly foolish if we didn't have accountability in our lives because we still fall to sin. But I can strive after righteousness and I can confess my sin to my brothers in Christ and depending on the sin to my sisters in Christ without fear of condemnation or being belittled because we have been set free. This is what freedom looks like. This is how our lives begin to operate with the freedom in Christ, Christ, so we can stop trying to earn the approval of God. So we can stop trying to read our Bible to win God's favor. We can actually open it and read it because we want to see him. We want to commune with him. We can stop praying in hopes that God would love us more. And we can start praying because we love him. We can stop fasting because we think being hungry makes us holy. When in fact, in freedom, when we fast, we fast because we want Jesus more than we want food. We want the giver more than the gift. And we can attend church not because we're trying to prove ourselves to Jesus or to the people that are around us. We can commit to this gathering because when we gather when the, with the body of Christ, we are gathering with Christ. And we can show up and serve because we love God and love his people. This is the freedom that is given to us. And I want you to remember that we need to stop judging people based upon what they do because they don't do what we want them to do. Because Christ is the one with the authority, not us. If you remember back to Colossians 2 verses 9 through 10, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Jesus is the substance behind every single thing that we do. It is his blood, his body, and his sacrifice that makes us right, that makes the things that we do good, right, and acceptable. We do it for him and not for us because it's out of a heart of, uh, of rejoicing and love for Christ that we become obedient to him not as a yoke of slavery, but because I love my heavenly father, so I want to honor him. I want to glorify him over all things. And all of this right here honestly ties back a little bit to what Zach Baker taught here last week. So if you weren't here, I would encourage you, go online and look at the sermon from last week. But this morning, what I do want to make abundantly clear, church, Abundantly clear is what I am not saying, N-O-T, not saying with three underlines. This is what I am not saying. I am not saying that in our freedom, we are able to live and do however we want, when we want. 
hear me say that. I am not saying, I don't want anybody to misconstrue this. I don't want to email later. I am not saying that you can do how you want and live how you want. Paul made that very clear in Galatians 5.13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Hear this. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. We are freed through Christ from the um, massive amounts of restrictions with legalism. But we are also freed from abusing that freedom. Because an abuse of freedom and legalism both flow out of a prideful heart that says, I know better, I can do better, and I can accomplish anything and everything that's set before me. What ends up happening when we are freed through Christ, we're free to love Christ because he first loved us. And when that happens and when our hearts are captivated with who God is, we're wooed by him. We fall deeply in love with who he is. So my obedience flows through a heart that is tethered to God. It doesn't flow from anger or frustration or duty. It flows from a heart that is tethered to him, that sinks up and beats with his. We are freed from Christ, freed through Christ to love Christ. And this should make the demands of the world, church, the demands of people that are around us look foolish. The desires and the indulgences of the flesh, meaningless, because they don't do anything. There's no hope in any of those things. And it is his love that changes lives. It's not obedience. It's not checking off boxes. It's not a, a well-crafted, beautiful sermon. This isn't that, but I'm just saying this is an illustration. It's a well-crafted sermon. It is not a beautiful church building that changes you. It is not small or large congregations that change you. It is not very talented singers and uh, musicians that are up here leading worship for us, ushering in worship with us, excuse me. This isn't a show for you, this is a participation as a body. What changes you is the presence of God. It is the presence of the one whom in and of himself says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Christ is enough. He is what changes us. He is enough. And God loves us despite our performance. I need you to hear me say that. God loves you despite your performance. I know that in the workforce world of things. We've been groomed to, to think, to believe, and to operate in, if I work harder, I will receive more. If I do better at the workplace, I'll be honored far more than the next man. And hear me, that makes sense. And believer in the room, we need to work hard to honor God, not to receive the, the attaboys from the people that are around us, but to honor God. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't make sense and it doesn't add up because he is enough. He loves us despite our performance because his perfect son, if you have repented of your sin and placed a saving faith in Jesus, washes over you. This is why our performance doesn't grant us acceptance into heaven. It is the blood, the perfect blood of Christ and his righteousness. This is something I believe we need to remind ourselves of every single day. It's not about performance, it's about presence. It's not about performance, it's about presence. You may have an awful day when it comes to work, but if you have been present with God and strive to honor him in all that you do, hear me say, you've won the day. You've won the day. 
And this is something I needed to, to teach myself. Not teach myself, but realize from the people that are around me. Because before, right before I stepped into my current role as lead high school and young adult pastor here, I was the associate pastor and student minister uh, at the uh, Riverdale campus up the road. And if I'm honest with you, man, as I was in that area in, at Riverdale, uh, I was in the sweetest, one of the sweetest seasons with the Lord. I say seasons very intentionally because we ebb and flow. God doesn't change, he's constant. But we ebb and flow. And I, I think that season for me was so sweet because I was not infatuated with my performance. I was not looking for the approval of man as I shepherded and led what God had entrusted to me. I had my eyes fixed upon who he is. My heart, my thoughts, my desires, and my steps felt like I was with God side by side, walking with him. They all flowed from him. And as I was thinking about that, like, am I doing that now? I had a, a heavy moment of uh, conviction fall on me because as I've stepped into this role, as lead high school and young adult pastor, what my mentality has been is let me see how many plates I can spin for how long I can spin them. I've began looking at my own performance. I've taken my eyes off of the Savior and placed them onto my circumstances and to the things that are around me because I was hoping if I can do this really well, if I can hold up the plates, maybe one day they will see that I could be a good pastor, that I could lead his church. hear me. That's not how this works. It is sinful of me to think that my performance and the people around me seeing my performance should elevate me. It's prideful. And it is not what God has asked of the shepherd. It is not what God has asked of you as the congregation, as the church. He has asked us to worship and sit in his presence. And I hope this helps you to see that simply because someone stands on this stage or gets behind this 700 pound pulpit that's up here, this thing's heavy they're any different than you. Every person that is on this stage struggles with sin. Every single person that's on this stage is not perfect. You can listen to Pat preach one time and know that. He's not here, I can say that. <laughs> My point is, church, it's not about your performance. Stop looking at all the plates that you can spin and all of the different things that you can do and fix your eyes on Jesus. Like the song we just sang, allow the things of this world to grow strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. It doesn't say in light of how good you can be. In light of his glory and grace. Our relationship with the Father is not about performance. It is about presence mentally, spiritually, and physically. It is about presence with the creator and sustainer of life. It's about presence with the one true God. And this is what my heart needed to be reminded of. It needed to be reminded of the gospel, that it is his blood and his atoning work that ushers me into his courts not what I can do and not what you can do. We need to remember that we are all born separated from God. We need to remember that we are born sinners full of hatred and rebellion against who God is, full of self-righteousness. And on our own accord, because of our sin, there's nothing that we can do to get to heaven. Nothing. You don't wield enough power for it. But our heavenly Father knew this and in his grace and in his mercy, while we were still sinners, he sent his son, Jesus. 
born of a virgin. So he didn't inherit the sin of his father like we did, Adam and Eve. Because of their rebellion in Genesis 3, I don't know if you know, but when you're born, you are born separated from God. My three-month-old daughter, no matter how beautiful as she is and how much she brings joy to my heart, she needs Jesus. So does my three-year-old. Y'all pray for her. She needs Jesus. Because of that rebellion, it's inherited. So that's why Jesus came and lived a perfect life. Perfect, without sin. And at the end of it, willingly laid his life down on the cross. And I need you to hear me say that, willingly. No one takes the life of Jesus. He willingly lays it down. He could have stopped the whole thing with a word, with a snap, with a breath, because he is God. But he was obedient to the will of his Father and willingly laid his life down, drinking every last drop of the wrath of God for our sin, not his own, for our sin, for your sin for my sin, because it was our sin that nailed him to that cross. It was our sin that drove the crown of thorns into his head. And it was our sin that beat him beyond all human recognition. You see, church, our sin is a nasty thing. And I know you probably feel like I'm yelling at you right now, but I need you to track with me because this is life. Our sin killed Jesus. But the beauty, the fact of him being 100% man so he can atone for our sin and 100% God is the fact that he rose again three days later and has since ascended into heaven, is now seated at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf until the day he will return again. He's praying for us. He's covering us with prayer. And if we will simply look upon him with love, with faith, repentance, and surrender and belief, you will be saved. You will be saved. It's not people who do better and clean up their act. It's people who surrender and believe that are saved. I needed to remember. We need to remember that Jesus' death took all of our unworthiness and in exchange lavishes us with his righteousness, clothes us with his righteousness. And because of that alone, we are granted into his courts and into his family. We are adopted as sons and daughters, having full access to who he is, what he can offer us. His presence So church today, I don't know what shadows you're sitting in, what shadows you're lurking in, and what shadows you think will save you. Hear me loud and clear, they don't do anything. What is the substance behind what you're chasing after? If it is not Christ and him alone, it's hopeless. We need Jesus, so today, Stop striving to earn his approval. Wave your white flag of surrender. Get on your knees and repent before the Father. And know that he is a loving Father that hears the cry of his children and will welcome you with open arms. Today is the day for salvation. And today is the day of surrender and repentance, church. Stop running. Stop trying to earn and fall before the feet of the almighty King Jesus. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father. We just want to say thank you. Thank you for the breath we have right now. Thank you for the heart that we have beating in our chest. Thank you for multiple generations of people sitting in this room now. I thank you that you hear us, that we don't have to go through mediators and do all of these different rituals. We can just cry out to you because of your atoning work. Father, I, I do ask today that you would save people. That you would move in the hearts of men and women and children sitting in this room and allow them to see whatever shadows they might be hiding in. Whatever shadows they might be hoping in. Father, bring them to the light. Allow them to bask in the warmth of your embrace. Your felt presence here with us this morning. God, we need you. We are helpless and hopeless without you. So move in us. Allow us to be obedient to you. Give us the, the desire. Give us the love. Give us the want. Give us the yearning to know you in a deeper and deeper, deeper way. Not so that we have some better theological understanding of who you are, but simply to know the one true God. Simply to know our Savior, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Simply to know you, Jesus. And may your presence forever change us. I know that we cannot come into your presence and leave the same way. So Father, I pray that people who walked into these doors that were dead are able to walk out of here with life. That we'll be able to walk out of here with community. That we'll be able to walk out of here with joy. Turn their mourning into dancing. Maybe we, may we be a people of dancing. <laughs> Turn our crying into laughter. May we be a people of laughter because of you. God, we love you. And it's in your perfect and precious son's holy name we pray. Amen. Church, thank you for being here today. It is, again, a privilege and an honor to step into the pulpit to communicate God's word to you. But I would ask that you do not leave this place before dealing with God. This stage, it's just a stage with some big speakers and some lights, but it can be an altar for you. You can come down here, get on your knees before God and pray. You can turn your seat into an altar, get on your knees and come down or turn around and pray. I'm gonna be over here to the left. There are people that are around you that if you want prayer, come down. We would love to pray for you. Intercession for God's people is a beautiful gift. So church, I love you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you for being here.